Hello. Hello. How's it going? It's been good. <laughs> How have you been? Not bad, just a little bit tired. Hmm. Is this your first time in uh, Cape Town? It is, yeah. And also South Africa? Yeah. Oh, this should be fun. That makes two of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to kind of take uh, sort of the next few minutes and cover a handful of things everywhere from how Ethereum started to kind of where we are now and then kind of uh, just take some, uh, uh, some of your thoughts on what we can and cannot do with this technology. Um, mm -hmm. But to kind of go uh, take a step back, I'd like to kind of just learn a bit more about sort of starting with Bitcoin. How did you get into this ecosystem? How did you get to start Ethereum mm -hmm. um, and the inspiration around the project? Uh, sure. So I first found out about Bitcoin back in uh, early 2011. And the way that I got into this space was I uh, found uh, people who are willing to pay for in Bitcoin for writing articles about Bitcoin. And first there was this uh, blog called Bitcoin Weekly, and then soon after that, this um, guy from Romania called Mihai Alicia reached out to me saying he was founding a Bitcoin magazine, and I became the head writer of that. Um, and then did that for a couple of years while going through school, starting university. Um, then about two years um, after that, I kind of went, went full time into the space, um, and I started you know, looking more heavily at a lot of different Bitcoin projects, and back then Bitcoin projects was basically all that there was. Started looking into you know, colored coins, some of the kind of more powerful protocols at the time, things like MasterCoin. Um, and um, eventually I realized that there was an opportunity to make something much more general purpose than what already existed. And so I, that was where uh, my kind of very earliest proposal for Ethereum came from. Like basically take kind of existing pr protocols that existed at the time, like MasterCoin, that basically said, here are 15 different things that you can do. Here's 15 different types of transactions for them. And instead say, well, you just have a programming language with one type of transaction. And inside of that programming language, you can kind of express the logic to just do whatever you want. So when you were thinking about extending uh, those existing projects or adding a bit more uh, of mm -hmm. abstraction, was that based out of a need or, or sort of just because you thought it was cool and we should do that? And I, it definitely just seemed like obviously the correct way to go. And about, uh, at the time, the number of applications that actually like, had users aside from Bitcoin itself was like basically zero. Hmm. For sure, a and kind of given how the project started with the goals you wanted to sort of accomplish, um, how would you compare that now with where Ethereum is and sort of the direction or, or even the use cases people have kind of adopted or, or converged to? Hmm. Uh, one, so interestingly enough, there, we've kind of come full, full, full circle in a way. So the kind of very early versions of Ethereum that were almost kind of proto-Ethereum, so even before Ethereum, the name um, came along, it was trying to generalize MasterCoin's uh, financial derivatives feature. And so then after that, and then a set of applications expanded and people started talking about non-financial applications like using blockchains to manage uh, decentralized storage systems, to manage, uh, to do things like ENS, like domain name systems, like identity management. And then uh, all of this enterprise stuff started, uh, started happening. And of course, in the last couple of months, people have just been really excited about decentralized finance. So. I thought that was kind of fun. So it's a lot of topics uh, that mm -hmm. you kind of foreshadowed on what we're going to talk about. Um, as a quick uh, reminder to the audience, we're actually going to be taking questions with the hashtag ETH Cape Town on Twitter. So if you have any questions you want to ask uh, Vitalik, uh, kind of tweet that question with that hashtag and we'll kind of filter them to me and we'll ask them on stage after the talk. Mm -hmm. um, I guess like given that, um, that's sort of definitely where the, the full circle of uh, Ethereum itself kind of came to be. How has your particular role changed over the past four, four years? Hmm. And the um, like, it's definitely changed a lot, especially just because of how the scale of the project increased. Like five years ago, it was basically myself and a couple of other people that were just figuring out everything and like figuring out the protocol, implementing the protocol, kind of bootstrapping the community, uh, setting up the um, Ether sale uh, back in 2014, like talking to security auditors. There was this kind of fairly small team that just did everything. And over time, the number of people in the ecosystem kind of went up and up more. And 
you know, we've had you know, more layers of abstraction added on, so it grew from being one team to this big Ethereum foundation that contained multiple teams. And then now, well, last year we've launched the grant program, and now mo uh, uh, probably the majority of the things the foundation funds is outside of the kind of quote foundation as an organization. So I feel like uh, s s many of the things I focus on have kind of become a bit more high, um, a bit more high level. Though, I mean, the result, the result, kind of always some of that. So, like, back in 2014, I wrote kind of blo a blog post about, like, shelling coin, which was this idea for a decentralized oracle. And, like, Augur ended up, I think, taking a lot of ideas from that. Mm, we're talking about a, a lot of these kind of different DAO concepts. And then maybe in, uh, a bit after that, I focused more on just getting proof of stake and sharding figured out. And right now, I basically think that, like, most of the, res the, almost all of the research problems are around, well, uh, definitely around, pr uh, uh, all around proof of stake and most around the sharding have basically been solved. And so now the, it's at the point where it's uh, like the, the spec for, th for at least the first phase of Ethereum 2.0 is kind of entering really finalization stages. And then f the phase one is, uh, <laughs> further beh further behind, but still like nothing fundamentally unsolved. And then phase two is uh, the thing that we're currently you know, focusing on trying to start piecing to piecing together. So I've been heavily involved in some of that, but then I also uh, you know, fo uh, spend my time thinking about kind of more high level things around the like, DAO design, like economics, governance, and all these other topics. That's awesome, and we're gonna dig a bit deeper into 2.0 uh, mm -hmm. soon. Um, kind of going back to um, the way you think about Ethereum as a platform, um, what are some of the applications that you think are sort of useful uh, to you or just in general you would like to see? Uh, and kind of where do you see as there's an opportunity for us to introduce a, anywhere from a smart contract platform to a blockchain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the short term, I think like the decentralized finance stuff that's been happening definitely has, is providing things that are useful and curly and providing things that have uh, value to people. And I feel like we've always had this idea in the space that finance is going to come first. And the usual kind of reason why I think that's the case is just because if you compare it to existing technology kind of other uh, outside of blockchain, finance just is the sector that's the most terrible. Like in many countries, like even really de like developed ones like the United States, like you'd be surprised just how insanely inefficient it is to move money between accounts. And once you start talking about international payments, then it gets even worse. Um, and, but anywhere outside of payments, like we've, people are already kind of used to, you know, just being able to spin up whatever you want in one click. And so the bar that, that anything decentralized blockchain has to compete with just purely usability wise is higher. But I think like now the, the the technology is starting to get better. Like it's definitely at the point where things outside of these kind of narrowly financial applications can really start taking off. So, so when you say decentralized finance, are you kind of in your mind referring to some specific kind of uh, financial instruments or, or a subsets of what that includes, or is it hmm. just a, the movement in general where you can have a better efficient system doing the same things we have right now? It's definitely a broad category. So like for example, most people would say maker counts as decentralized finance, auger counts, uniswap counts. Um, but then these tends to be fairly kind of pure applications, like stuff just happens inside of the crypto space and people use it and there's not too much connection to kind of things out, um, outside of the blockchain, and except for maybe kind of the, the price feeds because you, you do have to like connect up to what the the actual value is of like a dollar or whatever, but then you, it's there's projects that are starting to kind of poke out more and make things that are financial but also kind of more closely connected to real world things. So for example, there's been a couple of projects trying to do and block smart contract based insurance, and these tends to be in the parametric insurance some applications. So they say you, know, you put money into a smart contract, and if say a f like a flood happens or there's not enough water or the temperature is like above some uh, some value, then you automatically get a payout. And you know, I know there's. A project, uh, there's a project called Hurricane Guard that's been trying to do this for natural disasters. There's something in Sri Lanka trying to do it for crop insurance. So that kind of 
area seems like something that more and more things are happening in. Mm -hmm. And I guess like maybe a bit briefly, what mm -hmm. are some of the, I guess, barriers to entry right now in terms of implementing uh, these types of uh, solutions compared to like kind of offering the same in the mm -hmm. traditional finance? So mm -hmm. uh, right now, a lot of the models we see in DeFi um, are mm -hmm. sort of collateral based. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you think there's a way to sort of evolve past that? Mm, evolving past collateral based, not sure because you know, they're you over can, collateral. Yeah, I mean, you can definitely improve collateral efficiency, but then you could argue that the collateral kind of base design of the whole thing is is an advantage in some ways. But like one in terms of improving kind of coll collateral efficiency, right? One of the um, interesting things that we can think about is that like I know this is pop this kind of model exists in Africa and it exists in other places too. There is these kind of rotating uh, kind of clubs where people just kind of coordinates to kind of put money into a, um, into a pool. And, and the designs differ, but basically it's to kind of help people save, but potentially you could also turn it into an insurance sort of uh, kind of application. And so if you try to kind of take these social models where you say you have kind of groups of people that are participating together, then often enough they can uh, reduce the amount of capital that you that you need because you can sort of share more. And I guess in this case, like where do you think identity and reputation kicks in, or, or is that even directly related? Yeah, um, identity and reputation is definitely something that's uh, very important. I think. Um, I mean. Is so first of all, uh, well, it depends what you mean by identity and reputation, because the word just it's means like broad. five different things. Like one meaning of identity is just being able to prove that you, who's trying to spend the money, is the same and like whatever it is that, it, that that received the money. And this is just user account security, but it's basically an identity problem. And there, the challenge is. That like the default approach to doing this is that you just have one key, but then if your key gets lost or if your key gets stolen, then you're basically screwed. Um, and trying to move beyond that and trying to, like one of the things I'm a fan of is this kind of social recovery approach that says you know you have five friends and they each get a share of your key, and it's kind of mathematically set up in such a way that any three of your five friends can recover your key if you lose it. You could do a similar thing for key revocations. So. Things like that are something that I'm interested in. Um, and the nice thing there is also that if we can create a kind of robust kind of identity management solution um, like just for doing things like that, then you can actually m kind of migrate it beyond just on blockchain things and even just to use it as an identity system for off blockchain applications. So that's one kind of identity, just this kind of full, purely sort of self, um, self at um, attested. The other, another, a second kind of identity is trying to, is these kind of anti civil um, metrics. So this is coming up with some kind of token where it's easy to get one, but it's like extremely difficult to get many. Um, and this is useful for like voting schemes. Um, it's it's useful for a lot of applications. But this is the sort of thing that, and you you could definitely use blockchains as an ingredient. But there's also this big design problem of how do you actually make the, make these systems. And then the third kind of identity basically is reputation, which is that like it's not just about proving you are like you are something, and it's not just about proving you are a unique human. It's about proving that you have uh, have certain properties, right? And uh, this could be kind of other people attesting to your trustworthiness. It could be um, other people or even organizations um, saying, you know, this we've verified something about this person. Government saying we verified something about this person. But like, then we start kind of talking about this idea that you have this ecosystem of the ability of p of identities to make claims about each other, and that's something that you can definitely leverage for like, reputation and credit and, and, and all these other things. I hope everybody's taking notes. There's like four ideas for a new mm -hmm. identity hack here this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one other thing, sort of uh, what we've seen in terms of um, historically, a lot of new and breakthrough technologies let you uh, sort of uh, leapfrog uh, some of the existing mm -hmm. infrastructures. Um, in terms of kind of seeing where Ethereum or, or blockchain in general plays a role in, mm -hmm. in certain geographies, um, 
how do you kind of think about uh, use cases for those types of things, anywhere from like maybe different ways of voting or, or finding a misappropriation of funds to like other unique use cases that may now be possible? Do you have any thoughts on sort of the topic here? Yeah, and there's definitely an opportunity for um, blockchain-based projects to just take a lead in, er in areas where existing in in infrastructure is either in a very far behind or just it doesn't really exist at all. Right? Like there's mm, there's definitely parts of the world where you you can just say, well, oh, you know, what's the point of this when you have your centralized like CFI apps that you can just use to send money to 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 other people in a couple of seconds, but that's not something, and even just going beyond beyond money, like even just things like insurance, things like even just giving people the ability to invest in things and all of these kind of other bigger services that are part of finance that go beyond just like sending money to people. Um, also outside of finance, like identi even identity and reputation too. Like I think these kind of socially driven models of identity could even, uh, potentially leapfrog more se centralized models of identity in places where those kind of centralized um, models of identity haven't really been fully estab uh, established yet. So I think uh, that's something interesting because uh, and, and it, it makes sense, right? Because like the information about who is uh, kind of trustworthy and like, who is willing to vouch for whom is something that kind of is pretty a decentralized thing. And They're more social. Than yeah, than yeah. I mean, the, like the the concept that it should that it's something that kind of gets centralized into these kind of formalized institu institutions and numbers is itself pretty new. So that's also something that I think is worth looking at. No, it's awesome. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess finance is not the only use case that we we see for Ethereum or, or blockchains in general. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of a lot of people at this hackathon that want to uh, build mm -hmm. stuff and and are looking for ideas. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that'd be cool for you to see um, people hack on? Um, anywhere from things on your wish list to mm -hmm. kind of cool improvements or additions that you would like to see? Hmm. I guess, and I feel like I've already said a lot of the things that I you know, care about, especially, uh, and I, I especially want to try to you know, see things that move either move beyond finance into these other areas or kind of combine elements of finance with elements of these other areas. Um, the other category of things I haven't mentioned is probably kind of supply chain related stuff, but I mean, that's just an area that I personally am kind of less fam familiar with like exactly what people have like d have done so far and like what and, and what the benefits are, but it's definitely something that's uh, worth exploring. Um, I, in general, I'd say just innovative, approaches to just solving these problems in 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 terms of just hu like people's ability to kind of connect with each other mm, and, and trust each other and all these things in a verifiable way yeah <laughs> um, um, um another thing i care about also is trying to like this is like technically harder to the next level but doing all of those things while preserving privacy and like, I mean, zero knowledge proof technology has just m advanced forward leaps and bounds over the last year, and it's something that there's ba basically tools for to start working with. So it's definitely something that's worth starting to explore. And like, you definitely want to take privacy seriously in these applications, right? Like, you don't want the fact that oh, Bob trusted Charlie sixty points, but then Bob decided to decrease his rating to to trusting Charlie thirty points. So like, you don't necessarily want that to be on a global public ledger. Um, so that's uh, like for a lot of these applications, I think there's ways to kind of do zero knowledge stuff to get the benefits, but without um, getting the, without kind of uncovering everything. So one example of this that I liked is um, like in cases where you want, all you want it, like basically one of the things I dislike about kind of the way the path that and kind of many parts of the internet are taking is this trend toward just using centralized identity as a crutch for everything. Um, and 
basically because it's like the, it, where often enough the problem you're trying to solve is much smaller, right? So for example, if the problem you're trying to solve is just making it difficult for people to create 10,000 fake accounts, then like sure you could solve that by just capturing everyone's identity, but then you've broke, you broke privacy. But there are ways to do it where you still preserve privacy, right? So like for example, if you have some existing identity system, then on top of that, you can put a Zcash-like kind of an an anonymizing and mixing gadget. And then basically you just use zero knowledge proofs to prove that you are one of these approved identities that's been, that's been checked by some system without revealing which one. And then you also reveal a magic number so that you can't kind of reuse that, identi that identity again w without actually revealing which one. It which one it is that, um, that you've consumed. So things like that I'm also um, uh, pretty interested in. Um, also, um, when we talk about account security solutions, I'm also, uh, a big part of this is just usability. Like you want these things to be uh, just like, and accounts like, this is some, like account security is just a hugely important problem, right? Because like if you actually want people to be using you know, like decentralized anything, then they're interacting with it, they're gonna be interacting with it through some kind of identity. And either that identity is broken or that identity is secure because it's controlled by some centralized mechanism, but then you're kind of losing a lot of the benefit, or it's secure through because of some decentralized mechanism, but then that's a, the thing that we have to build, right? So like, if you want to actually use any of these decentralized financial solutions to and expect people other than kind of existing tech geeks to be able to use them and benefit from them, then, you need some kind of so account security solution that uh, that, that works for people, right? And that w even that works for for people that just haven't had that much exposure to computers yet. And then and that's a hard challenge. Absolutely, and it also sort of ties uh, in with the scalability of the underlying platform too. And yeah. kind of touched on E two point oh, but. Mm -hmm. Could you sort of describe uh, sort of the goals of what the 2.0 clients are and, and kind of the mm -hmm. phases and, and uh, just give us an update on uh, the progress? Um, sure. So, and for those who haven't heard this before, I mean, the um, Ethereum 2.0, like first of all, it's the two kind of major flagship components of it. One is Casper, which is our proof of stake algorithm, which replaces mini mining proof of work consensus with something that at least we consider to be more much more efficient. And the second part is sharding, which is a kind of massive scalability improvement that happens because you don't need um, every computer to in the network to process like every transaction in the network anymore. So it's split up into three phases, where phase zero basically does proof of stake. Phase one does sharding, but just sharding for kind of verification of data availability. And phase two does kind of full sharding, including verifying like transaction execution, smart contracts, and all these other things. So at the end of phase two, it's a complete system, but then for phase zero and phase one, it's, it's still kind of part useful for some things. So currently the phase zero spec is like very close to completion. Um, the phase one spec is going further behind, but the fundamental components are just all, are all in place and it's just an editing job. Phase two is still a bit further away, but it's uh, rapidly working on that. In terms of client implementations, right? So there's these multiple teams that are mostly even not part of the Ethereum Foundation itself, though uh, many of them are supported by grants that are building clients. Uh, so basically like nodes um, that would run as part of the Ethereum 2.0 network. And that's, um, like so far the ones that are furthest ahead, so that would probably be Lighthouse, Nimbus, maybe Prismatic, they've been, and I know Nimbus was the first to like, publish a testnet, I know Lighthouse is gonna publish a, I think publish a testnet fairly soon. So it's we're definitely getting to that stage. Um, would you sort of mind just telling us sort of what the performance improvements end up being with these implementations and kind of wh what is the change we're, we're seeing? Sure, so with sharding, the goal is to get about a thousand factor increase in scalability. Um, basically just the way you do this is through not requiring every computer to process every transaction, right? Every computer only processes a small portion of transactions and that removes the kind of biggest scalability bottleneck in the whole design. 
That was an X. That's mm. awesome. <laughs> um, one of the, the things we've done in uh, some of our previous chats is a, is a section called uh, underrated or overrated. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that section works is that I'm going to say a topic and uh, you get to comment on if this is underrated or if it's overrated and mm -hmm. sort of why. Um, so I'll kind of list a handful of topics um, and uh, maybe we can get some more from, from the audience uh, on Twitter. But uh, I'll kind of start off with uh, DeFi, underrated or overrated. Mm, um, prob in definitely slightly uh, g getting overrated at this point. Um, but I mean, the parts that are underrated, I think, is like the part that basically tries to kind of push this stuff from theory into practice and tries to like, see you know, like, what does it actually mean to get, like, if this stuff provides value to um, like, people even uh, just outside of the crypto space, how do we actually realize that value? And that's something that I think it would be good to get more attention on. Um, specifically, stable coins, underrated or overrated? Probably, I mean, I'd say people talk about them enough at this point. Hmm. So is that uh, <laughs> underrated or overrated? Hmm. Um, I pro honestly, it's also kind of slightly overrated at we'll this point. We'll move on to the next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, Bitcoin forks. Bitcoin forks. Um, I mean, I think BSV is like still overrated for as long as the market cap has multiple digits. <laughs> um, I mean, Bitcoin Cash, I think, even actually underrated at this point, and basically just because they've like, I mean, if you actually follow the community, they've become they've just become cons considerably more sane ever since they've expunged the uh, Bitcoin SV people. And <laughs> like, they're going, like they're getting Schnorr signatures ahead of Bitcoin. Like that's, that's, that's cool. Actually impressive. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah like, they've got like real tech, technical talent in there. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's getting <laughs> interesting. Hmm. Uh, what about uh, forks in general? Hmm, forks in general, I'd say underrated. Like I think, um, at this point, especially if you wants to launch a new decentralized chain, then like forking an existing one is like I think even better than doing an ICO or like an I whatever O. Basically, just because it's and you just get a much kind of you get a much better coin distribution that way. Um, you also kind of can tap into an existing community. Um, more people like you and fewer people hate you. Um, it, 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 Occasionally, like it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it does have a lot of uh, a lot of benefits to it, and like even if you like do a fork and add a, uh, and add a pre mine, like it's just like that space. I think is actually like has actually been sort of underexplored relative to just other ways of launching projects that do have tokens in them. Hmm. No, that makes sense. Uh, what about uh, blockchain governance? Um, depends which circle you're talking in. I think if the circle is crypto, then definitely overrated. Um, if the circle is Ethereum, actually honestly overrated as well. Um, like basically because I think uh, <coughs> like especially in the short term, mo uh, well if we're talking about governance of Ethereum, then most of the things that Ethereum needs to just survive and prosper in the next couple of years are not really contentious governance issues. Like, we know we need ETH 1.x, we know we need Layer 2, we know we need ETH 2.0 and Casper and sharding. And it's, um, yeah, like I'm not convinced that kind of tweaks to governance itself can really Im improve things by the, th that much in that regard. I mean, what can improve things is definitely you know, tweaks to things like ecosystem funding, for example. Hmm. That was actually my next topic, ecosystem mm. funding, mm -hmm. underrated or overrated? Mm, um, hmm, definitely still slightly underrated at this point. Um, I mean, we've, like, I'm actually really happy that the Ethereum community is starting to kind of start tackling these issues of um, public funding public goods in the ecosystem seriously and trying to you know, experiment with different approaches that go beyond the Ethereum Foundation. Like I think it's it's definitely healthy that the foundation is not the uh, only source of, uh, of funding because just with any, or like every organization has weaknesses, every institution has blind spots and so the more that we have to cover for each other's blind spots I think the better a, ch um, a chance the Ethereum ecosystem has.
Absolutely, and, and kind of similar to what we just kind of mm -hmm. talked about, um, the approach that E2.0 clients are taking mm -hmm. to build this thing independently of the foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any comments on that? Is that underrated, overrated, unexplored? Mm. Um, how do you see that? It depends which aspect. So I think in general, the model has been uh, very successful. Like the, mo the, end, the original goals of this, right, were basically to say that you know, we're going to push the job of developing these youth 2.0 clients outside of the foundation. And the foundation is going to develop one client, which is the Python client, as a reference implementation. But it's deliberately written in a slow language. And so it's the. To What's the rationale for uh, kind of offloading that to. Yeah, I mean, of we the basically foundation. just want to prevent the foundation from becoming too big a point of centralization. Because in ETH 1.0, we've just noticed it's become this kind of geth and parody duopoly. And it would be nice to, I mean, the fact that it's a, a duopoly and not, and, and not a monopoly is something that actually saved us during the denial of service attacks some a couple of years ago. But it would be healthier to have even more clients. So we want to have that kind of balance of power in the community. Um, and, and also just, kind of ensure against the risk that the Ethereum Foundation will just have internal governance issues and not be able to get its acts together. So it's it's one of these kind of strategies of you know, like let's support different approaches and hope you know, it well and these approaches are gonna work pretty differently and if if even if one of them succeeds then the things uh, can get off the ground. Now of course and I think in you know, the Ethereum Foundation has been um, done quite well over the last a year over the last year and a half in many ways and there's definitely many ways that it's improving still but I think uh, the grant program has been one of the biggest successes um, the thing that I think is that, that I think it's doing a, the ETH 2.0 client ecosystem is doing a bit incorrectly is that I think it's gotten the level of decentralization has gotten to the point where it's duplicating things too much like we're talking about like how many implementations was it? Nimbus, Prismatic, Lighthouse, um, Shasper, Pegasus, Trinity, Harmony, Geth, um, the chain, sa uh, chain safe, um, Dean Eigenman's thing, I forget the name, like 10. Yeef. And, yes, Yeef. Um, <laughs> so basically, like these 10, like, Going from one to th to four and five is good, but then these last five, like, it, first of all, they're not they're clear. There's no way that, that we're not going to have we're going to have enough resources to push all ten to the best level of quality. And so I think the thing that these implementations should try to do is they should try to potentially specialize more and specialize more in different things. So like for example, one of them could specialize more in light clients. The other could, in, could specialize more in like, developer tools or validator tools. And potentially they could even like share some components. Right? One, so basically instead of having 10 things that are copying the same thing, like you still need some, like, some amount of copying for redundancy, but it, a bit less than you have now, but instead you have more kind of branching out into different areas and into different philosophies. Um, also kind of going like light client first as one branch that would be good to see mobile first, which is pretty similar. Um, a light client for Ether, for ETH2 inside of ETH1 and like inside of other blockchains. Um, a light client for ETH2 inside of a Snark circuit. Like there's definitely um, different things that you can't the, that you can do and I think of trying to be more kind of creative and imaginative in that way is something that would be interesting to see more of the 2.0 teams doing. No, that's awesome. Um, hmm. In uh, <coughs> So one of the questions I kind of got before uh, when I was coming up with the list of questions here um, was sort of it feels like a lot of the contributors are from the US or North America or Europe. Mm -hmm. How can somebody who is not one of these regions, like how can they get involved in, in kind of this ecosystem, the development, mm -hmm. and kind of uh, just in general like with, with these projects? Like, can I, Do you have any thoughts on sort of mm -hmm. um, what the ways are and maybe kind of contrast that with the grants program by the Ethereum Foundation as well? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd say like even like Asia as a region is starting to do pretty, you know, doing better and better tech-wise. Like I was just in Korea last week, and there was a team there that was just working on a pretty novel way to build a plasma implementation, and they actually got pretty far. So that would that made me really happy. Um, I, so 
I think in, it depends on what region. So some regions, I think, are handicapped by language. Like basically, they um, like the resources are mostly in English. Um, and if you don't speak English, and even if you don't speak English as a first language, that just puts a huge barrier in front of you trying to participate in the ecosystem. So supporting translations is one thing that we as a community can do to help. Um, otherwise, also in just education in, gen uh, in general, but then in, if you have those, those things, then like if people have, if people have the, no the kind of the, no the knowledge and the skills and, and, and kind of know where to go, like a, I mean, a lot of the teams are pretty global and they'll be happy to just have contributors from in like Africa or India or just South America and anywhere, um, but that's you know, there's obviously a long way between in between kind of the status quo today and everyone who potentially could be contributing like actually uh, actually having that knowledge so you know, trying to you know close those gaps is definitely something that's important absolutely mm -hmm. um sort of tangential to what we've talked about um i wanted to ask sort of the question that uh, i think that's kind of been uh, popping up a lot recently uh to a lot of the a lot of the people in the world uh certain messaging apps are the internet, mm -hmm. uh, by all means. Um, and when you have uh, sort of a scenario where uh, anywhere from different apps having hundreds of millions to billions of users, um, to the audience there, that's kind of what they know and, and kind of see as, as how do you get access to information. Mm -hmm. If any of them uh, kind of offer anywhere from decentralized type solutions to, to uh, kind of issuing their own money or currencies, um, and kind of just promote uh, financial applications leveraged by blockchain. Um, do you think that's a good thing? Is that a net positive? Does that kind of negate any of the existing kind of beliefs that either you or the community holds? And kind of how do you perceive mm. that? And the, that's definitely one of those kind of double-edged swords. Like it's like a big part of, uh, I guess it, it depends on like the application. It depends on you know, whether like, what you see the benefit of like blockchains and decentralization as being, but I mean, at least to me, it's def like a big part is definitely just kind of empowering people, not just as consumers but also as producers, and that's something that I think like blockchains even just do really well because it's, it's not just that anyone can use an app; it's all a, a DApp. It's also that anyone can just b go ahead and build one, mm -hmm. and that's something that I think is. Mm, like, really valuable and we should try to preserve more. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. Um, mm -hmm. So we're actually gonna just gonna move into the Q&A part here. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of questions that I've received so far, so I'll try to ask as many as possible. Um, and I'm gonna start off by uh, the first one, which is um, will, will the blockchain data uh, stay in gigabytes or, or what are the plans for it to be smaller in the future? The blockchain data. Um, so the... I mean, the history can only grow, right? But what we are plan think the client developers are thinking of doing is kind of pruning history. So either like not storing history that's older than say one year, or just moving it to some different uh, data structure, like could be IPFS or some kind of shorted data store of some kind. So that would uh, knock things down. Um, the size of the state, so the amount of information you need to have on hand to just validate the next block, that's something that um, there, there are proposals to try to decrease. So there's the rent proposal, there's the stateless client proposal. So those are things that are kind of starting to happen. Um, so there's definitely plans to try to reduce the kind of storage requirements of an Ethereum uh, node in multiple ways. No, for sure. Um, I guess one, one other question we have from the audience is, uh, what are sort of the biggest ways uh, E2.0 will change how uh, people build their dApps? Hmm. I think um, I mean, just as a developer, being kind of relying, like, the, the environment is going to become more asynchronous. So because, like, especially if you have a dApp that scales to more than one shard, like you'll have to, you're not, like, you're not going to be able to communicate between different shards exactly the same way as you can communicate inside of like one shard or inside of ETH 1.0 1, 1 today. So coming up with, uh, Kind of programming patterns that that 
you know, deal with that reality, I think is um, going to be one of the challenges. Um, also, um, I expect data to be cheaper relative to execution. So approaches that are more kind of, and, and relative to state. So I expect approaches that are more kind of data heavy and less execution heavy and state heavy on chain are um, go going to make, uh, start making more sense. Um, hmm. Those are probably, um, we're hoping that block times are gonna get faster and um, that they're gonna get more regular and that kind of short range forks are gonna become more rare. And so the experience will be a, a bit closer to what you, you can expect to get out of a centralized system. Okay, well, um, <laughs> from a, a question from a tweet that you uh, did earlier today, um, what would the world have looked like if you had gotten the internship at Ripple? I don't know, like. You can skip it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what is your favorite meme? My favorite meme. Specifically the one you would choose to represent yourself. Oh, that's not my favorite meme. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't. I, I don't really have a list of like favorite memes. What are some of your favorite memes? I'm supposed. Am I supposed to have like a meme on a list of memes on hands that I like? <laughs> like, how do I answer this? I, I, I don't. I don't keep up with the millennial culture anymore. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll come back to this one. Yeah, we'll um, come back to it. Okay. <laughs> um, on another less serious note, uh, who do you think is Ethereum's biggest competitor? Hmm. It depends, I mean, well, ultimately uh, existing centralized systems and new centralized systems that try to kind of take um, just enough elements of blockchaining to look cool, but are, but actually just um, are the same old stuff that we've had for decades. Um, I guess, well, I guess when you say that, does that mean um, you kind of envision this as a, a general purpose, one solution for everything type? platform or, or is it more of the mm. fundamental technology itself lets you do this thing but different solutions In Ethereum is definitely not kind of by, or by itself not optimal for every use case. I mean there are plenty of cases where you just wants to build centralized things. There's plenty of cases where you need decentralization but you don't need a blockchain. There's pl cases where like you just want some really high performance specialized thing. Sometimes you might want some layer two thing that's on it that um, connects into Ethereum. And so there's definitely different trade offs. And for different applications, it makes sense to do things in different ways. No, that makes sense. Um, in terms of, <coughs> so there's a question that says um, Is there a possibility that nation states could uh, censor or block Ethereum or, or dApps? And if so, how would they do that? Hmm, could nation state censor block Ethereum or dApps? Um, and there's definitely things that they can do easily that they're not doing already. The simplest one is just banning exchanges. Um, like if you just make it like five times harder for people to get cryptocurrency, then that just makes it significantly harder for any application that depends on it. Like even the non-financial ones to get the very, very large scale adoption. I mean, we'll, like, and like, will the space be able to kind of survive if the whole, like, if most of the world does that, even, even that's an, un, uh, an, an unproven hypothesis? I mean, if they want to do more, then there's definitely in the, uh, different kind of ways that they could attack it, but then there's ways that these that platforms could harden themselves, and then it starts becoming pretty complicated. Do you kind of envision that as a cat and mouse game, or, or is it more of... I and mean, it's there's definitely cats and there's definitely mice, so yeah. Hmm. Fair enough. Um, one, <laughs> that's factually correct. Um, <laughs> Did you know there's also pigeons? <laughs> one, uh, one other question we have from the audience, and we'll, we'll kind of get maybe one or two more in, and then we'll wrap so this up. So when I visited Korea last a couple of weeks ago, I saw a meerkat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. What's the question? <laughs> um, do you think uh, uh, side chains will be redundant in the future? And, and can I maybe for, for context kind of just go over what they are? And, and so by, I guess if by side chain you mean this uh, kind of older idea that you have chains that 
just have some kind of connection to some uh, some other chain that and that don't really have where the security model basically is that you do have to trust the side chain. Yeah, I mean, I honestly think like there's not much need for those. Like the only kind of side chain that really makes sense is the non-custodial ones, like Plasma. I, uh, I would say, um, well. And plasma, plasma just basically is the word for the category of non-custodial side chains. So uh, I'm, I'm definitely kind of bullish on those things. Um, otherwise, like things that require trusting kind of specific groups of nodes, where like it's difficult for users from far away to, to, to determine whether or not they should be trustworthy. Like why do that? Hmm. Sure. I, I got two more, and then we'll wrap this up. So um, uh, one question from the audience is, uh, what are some of the the risks uh, for this ecosystem or things that keep you up at night? Mm. Um, definitely just the biggest risk is us not being able to do the, to build things kind of uh, fast enough. And like the usual thing that people say is, you know, like, oh, if we don't build this fast enough, things fast enough, then a, like some other blockchain competitor will take over. But the other risk, as I mentioned, that potentially is even larger is that if the space takes too long, then like existing centralized systems will just continue improving themselves and will have lost a big opportunity to just make you know, decentralized um, applications and data layers like actually be the foundation for like a, a generation of um, applications getting built on them. No, that's mm -hmm. great. And then, and kind of just to finally end, mm -hmm. um, what does decentralization mean to you, and and mm -hmm. why is it important? Yeah, and decentralization uh, means you know, lots of th different things to different people, and it also just depends on mm, what the what application you're you're building um i would say some of the biggest benefits are like a big one is just trust right so like if you're building something and you intend it to be like infrastructure or like a platform that other people build on top of that's something that really just should be decentralized because that's like the way the only way you have to just really make like be sh clearly show to, to your users that you're not going to kind of sweep the rug up from um, uh, from under their noses or whatever the expression is um, when the, when they've already built the pl uh, built the platform and they're locked in. Like even just the fact that we use the word platform to refer to just centralized things maintained by one guy is kind of sad, honestly. Um, like I th think <clears throat> if we're building things that entire kind of e entire economy is and um, ends up relying on it should just be something that's kind of common infrastructure that you once it's built um, there's not like one party that can either get either get hacked causing it to, to uh, causing the whole thing to stop working or kind of become a monopoly and start trying to extract rent from all of that or get captured from some political interest that represents only a small subset of the users of the system so <clears throat> I think uh, Having some kind of, of pro properly decentralized base layers for many things is something that makes sense. I'm also just um, generally interested in this idea of uh, just building new kinds of uh, uh, new kinds of mechanisms and new kinds of ways to kind of motivate people to uh, collaborate with each other. And like that could that could mean economic incentives. It could mean things like DAOs. It could also mean and of social incentives, po possibly some combination of both. Um, and there, the goal, like one of the big goals is just like that's like more decentralized approaches just are how you get better information efficiency. Like as I mentioned, right, most of the information about how trustworthy people are, for example, like who is, um, like what things are valuable to whom, how valuable are, are, di are different things, like that's, does, that doesn't exist in central servers that exists kind of split uh, split up between all um, eight billion of us. And so that's like these more decentralized approaches that allow people to kind of participate uh, in all parts of the ego uh, and, and all sides of the ecosystem, I think are something that are really valuable in that sense. Hmm. With that, Vitalik, thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. <coughs>